Hello, everyone. Um, so we are doing things slightly uh, different today. So instead of uh, having a live tutor session today, I decided to record early this morning uh, so that you guys have a little bit more time to uh, go over the video, um, do some practice questions, as well as uh, study for the exam tomorrow. Um, I know you guys have the exam tomorrow. So um, with that being said, I'm going to uh, do a exam one review session today, and it will be covering perioperative diabetes respiration nursing care. Um, so some tips for this exam is this is the first exam. Um, these, make sure you guys know the content uh, for this three big uh, topic, uh, especially know the different roles of the nurse um, during pre-operative, perioperative, and post-operative. Uh, she might ask you, what is the specific role of the nurse during that period of time? And also knows uh, regarding the lab values, the medication, when should we stop? Um, as well as know uh, uh, the insulin for the diabetes and also the signs symptom of diabetes and definitely know DKA because it will be on there. Uh, respiration is a big thing as well. Uh, so know the patho of like the diseases and um, uh, kind of know um, uh, which one is reversible and which one is not. Uh, with that being said, um, I hope you guys will enjoy the session today. So before we start, I want to show you guys this, uh, this page. Um, let me go ahead and start it. Play from here. Okay, so uh, this is the Kahoot Links practice questions. Uh, this was created by uh, Sarah. Uh, she's uh, uh, in my cohort uh, and she created um, a a long time ago, uh, but the questions are very relevant. So I really recommend you guys um, do all three of this after you guys go through the uh, the tutor session. Uh, the, after this tutor session, it's like a like forty questions or something each, uh, but it will help you guys uh, strengthen the content base that you guys have. Um, I will post this page on the. Uh, the Facebook cohort, as well as I will link down to uh, the, the, the description box on the YouTube channel. All right, with that, all that being said, we are go ahead and go to start the review session. So definitely you guys need to know your lab. Um, make sure you guys know the lab and make sure you guys know um, when it's out of normal range, whether it's lower or higher, what does it mean? What does it indicate? So with WBC is white blood count. So if it's less than 4.5, the patient not be able to fight the infections, meaning they are immunosuppressive. Uh, if it's more than 11, it means that the patient is having an infection, which is not good because they can develop fever and they're having an infection in the body. So definitely uh, know uh, the regular range of white blood cells is 5,000 to 10,000. If it's out of that range, higher than 10,000, meaning the patient is having an infection, and less than 5,000, meaning the patient is not able to fight infection. Next, we have hemoglobin. So hemoglobin for women is 12 to 16, and for men is 14 to 18. So if hemoglobin is less than nine, we have to notify the doctor. Uh, so the reason why we have to notify the doctor if hemoglobin is low is because hemoglobin is um, a an agent in the blood cells in the in the blood that carry oxygen. So if we don't have enough hemoglobin, the blood won't carry oxygen. And without oxygen, we won't be able to perfuse for the organ for the rest of the tissues of the body. So hemoglobin is very important. How do I remember this? So hemoglobin 12 to 16. So I remember for women, for girls, they usually um, hit puberty. Uh, before men, so they hit puberty around 12 to 16, whereas men is about 14 to 18, uh, which is kind of late, but it's just how it stick in my head. So 12 to 16 for women, 14 to 18 to men. Okay, next we have hematocrit. Hematocrit is the percentage of the red blood cells. So it's 36 to 48 
of in women and 42 to 54 in men. So if you guys look at this, this number is three times the number of the hemoglobin. So if you guys remember, okay, 12 to 16 uh, women hit hippity, and then in order to get the hemato hematocrit, you guys can times by three, then you can get the number of the hematocrit because 12 times three is 36, 16 times three is 48, okay? So um, the hem hematocrit is, like I said, is the percentage of the uh, red plus cells. So it uh, is uh, notify us whether the patient have enough circul circulatory blood. So if we have too high of a percentage of a red, uh, hematocrit, of percentage of red plus cells, the blood will be very thick because the percentage of the red plus cell is higher. The viscosity of the blood is very thick. The lower the hem hematocrit, the thinner the blood is. Uh, okay, so next we have red plus cells. Red plus cells is from 4.5 to 6. Platelets count. Platelets count is really important to remember. Um, definitely notice. So it's the range is 150 to 400, and we need to notify uh, if it's less than 100,000. So um, if it's more than 400, the patient at risk for developing clots, uh, which is not good because if clot travel in the blood vessel, it can cause obstruction. So we do not want too high platelet, but we also do not want too low platelet less than 100 or less than 150 either because um, the patient at risk for bleeding, okay? Uh, so check for Lovonox. Lovonox is the, um, the blood thinner, the anticoagulation medication. So the contraindication of low giving Lovonox is less than 100,000 platelet. So if we give Lovonox and the, the blood platelet is less than 100,000, we have to withhold the medication, okay? Next, we have BUN. BUN is 10 to 20, um, but usually it's uh, from Professor Lanasa is 8 to 25. So I just remember like a burger is 10 to $20, 8 to $25. So something like that. Creatine. Creatine is the number one indicator for kidney function. So the lower, uh, the higher the creatine level, the worse the kidney function is. So please remember that 0 0.6 to 1.3, okay? So if she, she give you a level of 1.9 or 2.0 creatine, that means that the patient kidney is very jacked up and they have really bad kidney. They have, may have issue with retaining water or does not produce urine. So that's the issues with the kidney creatine. So kidney function is compromised. The higher the number, the worse the situation the kidney is, okay? Next, we have potassium. Potassium is 3.5 to 5. Please remember this. Calcium is 9 to 11. So I remember it's at call 911. Sodium is 135 to 145. Potassium, again, is 3.5 to 5. Magnesium is 1.5 to 2.5. I remember this as Maggie is 1.5 to 2.5 years old, a little uh, cousin or something. Um, chloride is 98 to 107. Next, we have PT. PT is 11 to 12.5, um, but from Professor Lanessa, uh, she wants us to remember as 9.6 to 11.8. That's the range she wants us to remember. Next, we have INR. INR is 0 0.8 to 1.1, and the therapeutic range of uh, INR is 2 to 3. So this is when, when the regular INR level of a, of a person who doesn't take uh, warfarin, which is the anticoagulant, it will be between 0 0.8 to 1.1. However, if I'm a, as a person, I take warfarin, the anticoagulant, the therapeutic level of warfarin, which is the blood level, drug blood level of warfarin should be between two to three that's when we know that the medication is effective and it's uh, working. Um, so uh, that is specific for warfarin. Um, always together and check for medication warfarin. So whenever she mentioned warfarin or coumadin medication, we always take PT, INR. These two labs always goes together. All right, 
Next, we have pre-op consideration. Of course, we have to look at the labs before we send them into the, uh, the surgery. If any lab is uh, not good, we have to notify the doctor before we send them into the, the surgery, okay? So another thing for pre-op is we need to empty the bladder before the surgery. It is so important that you guys know this. Must empty bladder before surgery. If the patient take any diuretic, we have to draw the potassium levels. Uh, that common sense, right? Because diuretic, they make the patient pee a lot. And when they pee, they excrete a lot of the potassium and we don't want the potassium too low. It can affect the hurt. If the patient check the G and the E, which is the herb, chinchin, ginkgo, uh, vitamin E, things like that, or blood thinners, we need to notify the doctors. Any anticoagulant blood thinner or NSAIDs must be off 72 hours to one week prior to the surgery. This you guys must know. So what are NSAIDs? NSAIDs include aspirin, uh, LV, ibuprofen, Coumadin and Plavix are blood thinners and anticoagulant. Um, herbs, so again, the cheese and the E's, ginkgo, ginger, Ginkgo, gecko, ginseng, vitamin E, vitamin G, uh, certain oil. This puts patient for, uh, for risk of bleeding. So we need to notify the doctor. If there's a question, uh, the patient uh, report that they recently take the G's and the E's vitamin within a day or before the surgery. We have to notify the anesthesiologist or the surgeon about this condition, about this uh, that the patient took these herbs or meds so that the, the surgery can be withheld. Next, we have pre-operative pre nurse role. So please remember this. She will ask you the role during the specific time in the perioperative. Peri so the role of the pre-op nurse is to assess to make sure the patient is safe, interpret data, communicate with doctor and patient education teach. So usually we teach before the surgery because that's when the patient is clear mind. They have, they don't, they're not under any influence of anesthesia. So we have to teach them before the surgery so that they know after the surgery, they have to do incentive spirometer. They have to start ambulating so that the, the, the process of healing is faster. Informed consent. So this might seem very easy, but remember, so please make sure you guys have on top of this. So the surgeon is the person who obtained the consent, explain the procedure. The nurse obtained a signature, witness, make sure the patient understand and inform. Okay. Next, we have malignant hypothermia. Malignant hypothermia usually occurs during the process of uh, interoperative. So this is often when the patient is receiving an anesthesia agent that they are allergic to or have an anaphylactic reaction to. Um, it is a reaction to an anesthesia agent. And one of the most common anesthesia agent that causes this is succinylcholine. So succinylcholine uh, uh, is, is very popular um, uh, when it comes into malignant hypothermia. So what are the signs and symptoms that the patient might show? The patient might have increased carbon dioxide level. Um, they will have tachycardia. The heart beats so fast that it can reach more than 150 beats per minute. And you guys know when the heart beats so fast, the cardiac output that it produces reduces. So there's not enough cardiac output to perfuse the rest of the body. The body becomes rigid. It becomes very tense, flex, and rigid. Their pulse will be increased. The muscle will be tense, rigid. They will have tachypnea. They breathe very fast. Uh, and then they'll have fever. Fever is a late sign. So please remember that. Fever is a late sign. Uh, this is because the, the reaction is caused because of the inability to regulate calcium in the body. Nursing management. There's two medication that we give to them. Dantrolene, this is to calm the patient muscle so that they don't tense or flex up. And then we give lidocaine to calm the hurt down so that the hurt beats slower. It beats more effectively and more cardiac output is produced to the rest of the body. 
And next we do ice cooling blanket to decrease the patient temperature. And then we give them 100% oxygen. So this is usually a genetic factors. History of family has issue with anesthesis. So the patient still can have surgery, but they just have to use another anesthesis. Next, we have intraoperative care. So whenever she asks about intraoperative care, so please remember we only need to do a time out before we do any surgery or procedure because this is to make sure that everything is correct. Make sure that we marked the right place, the, the right operative site. We have the right patient, the right procedure. Make sure that the consent is there. If there's no informed consent, they cannot start the surgery. What are the patient allergies? Whether it's latex, whether it's um, iodine. So if the patient is allergic to latex, usually they're allergic to bananas and kiwi, stuff like that. If the patient allergic to iodine, usually they're allergic to shellfish. Role of the nurse safety and comfort. So intraoperative is safety and comfort. This is the role of the nurse during this period. So please remember that. Patient positioning and align during surgery. We, the nurse have to pad and pillow all the bony prominences on the patient body. Position, they strap the patient on the OR table and then they put the side rails up. They count supply before and after surgery. This is because to avoid leaving any um, scrub or any uh, surgery equipment inside the body of the uh, patient. So in the operative surgery place, it can get very cold. So patient can get hypothermia. So the nurse needs to monitor temperature, give the patient heated blanket and warm the IV fluid. Wow, okay, next we have post-op complication. This is the meat. This is what you guys want to know. Uh, the role of the nurse is, of course, prevent complications. So post-op is all about preventing of complications. So complication occur can occur immediately after the surgery. So immediately after the surgery is between the zero to 24, first 24 hours. Uh, this is not day one. This is, be, this is zero to 20, first 24 hours. So this patient is... At, significant risk for bleeding, which can lead to hypovolemic shock. And we know that we don't want hypovolemic shock because in hypovolemic shock, we don't have enough blood circulating the body. And when there's not no blood, there's no perfusion, no perfusion, meaning the organs will not function as they should be. And there will be complication relating to that. So the sign symptom of bleeding that the nurse uh, must always assess is pain at the incision site, increased heart rate, low blood pressure, weak thready post, diaphoresis, decreased urine output, pale cyanotic hypose, shortness of breath. So her increased heart rate and low blood pressure is the classic, classic sign of hypovolemic shock. Um, decreased urine output is because they they lose the volume of the blood. So there's not enough volume circulating through the kidney. So the kidney cannot filter the blood and make urine. So that's why we have a decreased urine output. So what is a, a bad urine output? So usually it should be 30 milliliters per hour. That's considered okay. Anything less than 30 milliliter per hour for urine output, you guys need to notify the doctor notify the doctor if it's less than 30 milliliter per hour of the urine. Next, we'll have to check the H and H to see if the patient is bleeding, see the, if they are thirsty. The nurse put another dressing on top of, until the surgeon comes and changes the first dressing. The surgeon is the person who changed the first dressing, okay? Treatment is IV normal saline or half normal saline. Put the patient legs up, the head down, which is the Trendelenburg position. And then we give them blood product and oxygen. If the patient is bleeding, the nurse put the pressure on the bleeding site, put the patient on the Trendelenburg position, and then give fluid a blood and then call MD. 
Next, we have day one after the first 24 hours post-op. So this is from the 25th hours to the, to the end of day one. So atelectasis is the most common complication that occurs during this period of time. And atelectasis in another simple word is collapse of the alveoli. So you guys know that alveoli is where the gas exchange occur. If there is collapsion of the alveoli, we won't have gas exchange and the patient will be very cyanotic. They will be hypoxic. Sign symptom, they'll have crackle breath sound, usually the end of inspiration and the beginning of expiration. Inspiration is when you inhale, you tell the patient to inhale, and when the patient at the end of the inspiration, you hear crackle, and when they start to expiration, exhale, you guys can hear crackle. Patient can have dyspnea, which is difficulty breathing. They can have asymmetric chest expansion. Uh, this is alveoli collapse. And this can progress to pneumonia if the fluid sits in the lungs. So we have to teach the patient incentive spirometer to do that. We teach, when do we teach them again? We teach them during the pre-operative phase. Please remember that. Uh, TCDB, turn, cough, deep breath. We have to tell them to do early ambulation, give them fluid and position changes. Next, we have day two. So day two, uh, the most popular complication is DVT, which is deep vein thrombosis. So different thrombosis, this is because the patient is immobilized, they're on bed rest, they lay on the bed for, for two days and they can't move or they can't do anything because of the anathea the agent, because of pain. So when they don't move, when the blood sits still in a place, it pull is called blood pooling. And when the blood is pooling, it will develop clots. And what happened when we develop clots? These clots from the legs can travel up to the lungs and, and or hurt or the brain. And when it travels to the heart, we, it causes a cardiac arrest, it causes an MI. And if it's go to the, the brain, we can have a, they can have a stroke because it's a glued the a blood vessel. So the blood cannot travel to that area. So that's why DVT is very dangerous. So that's why we teach the patient to do early ambulation because when you move, you're massaging your vein. Sign symptom is leg, cough, pain, swelling, redness, weak pose, less palpable pose. Okay. So prevent is SCDs, sequential compression device. Mobility, of course, early ambulation, compression stops blood thinner or low for nerves. So for example, if there's a question that say that you're assessing the patient on day two post-op and they have calf pain, swelling, redness, and you when you palpate a pedal pose, it's very weak, uh, what do you do? So obviously you're not gonna massage the patient legs because that will make the clot break and travels. So you do not, do not, do not, Massage. What do you do? Um, you administer blood lobonox and then you um, uh, you assess for patient platelet and um, you call the doctor. Okay. Uh, every time giving lobonox, we must remember again risk for bleeding because lobonox is an anticoagulant. It, and what is the classic sign for bleeding? Decreased blood pressure, high pulse weak ready pose, increased heart rate and increased respiratory rate. Decreased blood pressure is why? Because the, when we bleed, the volume of the blood reduces. So the blood pressure is, is reduced as well. And the heart can sense that the blood pressure, the heart can sense that the volume of the blood is reduced. So it tries to beat faster in order to perfuse to the body. So that's why we have that classic sign of low blood pressure and high heart rate in patient who are bleeding. Uh, we also must assess for platelets when we give Lovonox. So only give if the platelet is more than 100,000, okay? We, where do we give Lovonox? We give Lovonox, this is fundamental. It's given in subcute area, subcutaneous, uh, also known as, uh, also at the area of the love handles and two inches away from the umbilicus. 
Next, we have day three, so infection. So infection took at least three days for infection to grow. So if she asks you any question regarding day one, post-op, day two, or after, immediately after the surgery, you won't have an infection. Infection will not be a choice because it took three days for infection to, to grow. Um, this can be atelectasis that progress to pneumonia or UTI. So sign symptom of infection is, of course, like I said earlier, elevated white blood count, anything more than 11,000. Bad odor, purulent drainage, productive cough, greco, sputum, and fever. Sign symptom include UTI, meaning um, a urinary, uh, yeah, uh, a, ure a urethra infection. Um, uh, it can be painful. There can be sediment in the urine. Like when they pee, there will be pieces of cloudiness and stuff, and they have cloudy urine. Urine. Uh, white blood count often increase after surgery, body immune response, but if it is gradual decrease, increase, it can indicate infection. So what does this mean? This means that because after the surgery, the body comes through a period of severe stress because the body is being cut open during surgery. So of course, it's go through a lot of stress. And when you guys go through a lot of stress, the human body will increase the white blood counts because it's just an immune response. So if you guys see a white blood count immediately after the procedure, that's okay. But if this white blood count persist and gradually increase after day three, we need to suspect that the patient is having an infection. Okay, and then uh, treatment is of course antibiotic, fluid, and hand hygiene. Next, we have something called wound dehydration and evisceration. So this is usually specifically for patients who have abdominal surgery. So um, when the patient have abdominal surgery, uh, they, the incision can be popped. So it can have two scenario. So wound dehiscence and wound evisceration. Dehiscence meaning the incision is separated, whereas the evisceration, the stomach contents will come through. So not only the incision is separated in evisceration, but also you guys can see the intestine protruding out of the incision. So how to prevent this? We have to use abdominal binder when the patient have abdomen, abdomen surgery. Uh, we give them pillow and put them in low flower position with knee bent, okay? So how do we treat? So we treat this patient by cover. We first position the patient in the low flower position with the knee bent to put the pressure off the, the abdomen. Then we cover the wound with moist and sterile normal saline dressing. Must be moist and sterile normal saline um, because the moist will continue to perfuse their circulation. If it's not moist, it can get necrotic. After that, we call the doctor then we administer anti-emetics is the nausea and vomiting, which could, because nausea and vomiting, when they do that, they can put a strain on the incision as well. So, and then we instruct the patient to splint when they cough. All right, diabetes mellitus. So you guys have to know this diagnostic test and also the confirmation test. So let's go through the diagnostic test first. So a random finger stick, anything more than 200 and has diabetic diabetes mellitus symptom could have diabetes. Repeat to do more tests to confirm. So this is not a confirmed test. Next, we have fasting plasma glucose. The ideal range for a healthy person is 70 to 100. When the patient fast, meaning not eating for about six to eight hours. If the level is more than 126, they can have diabetes mellitus. We need to do more tests to confirm. So it's guaranteed more tests for this patient. Next, we'll have two hour plasma glucose level, OGTT. This, if it's greater than 200 with glucose load of 75 gram, the patient is suspecting of having diabetes. So they have to do more tests. 
So this test is basically we give the patient 75 gram of carbs and then we check them again in two hours. And if the level is more than 200, it means that they might have diabetes. <laughs> Lastly, we have A1C test. So A1C test is a test uh, that cover a long period of time. It covers three months. So it, it, uh, if it's 6.5% or higher, it indicates that the patient having, is having diabetes. Uh, it's called glycosidated hemoglobin A1C. It reflects the glucose level over the, the past two to three months, but three months. Um, goals is if the patient is already have diabetes and they come in to check the A1C, we want them to maintain the A1C between 6.5 to 7 to reduce the complication that diabetes can bring. Um, a good person who managed a good diabetic patient who manage their blood glucose level and care about their diet and health, usually the A1C is less than seven. A person who have bad management of their A1C, of their diet and health, it's the A1C will reflect it and it will be more than eight. So how do we confirm uh, diabetes mellitus? In order to confirm diabetes mellitus, First, we have to check the fasting blood glucose level, meaning that the patient cannot eat anything six to eight hours before the test. So if the, after six to eight hours of not eating and the blood glucose level is still more than 126, meaning that we going to test another day, but with a finger stick random glucose. And if this is 200, more than 200, we will finally do the OGTT test, which is the oral um, glucose tolerance test uh, at, in another day. And we give this patient 75 gram of carbs and then we recheck them in two hours. So if this is more than 200, then after these three tests, we confirm that the patient have diabetes. Okay, so hypoglycemia treatment. Hypoglycemia is going to be on there, guys. You guys have to know when hypoglycemia occurs and how to treat it. It's very simple. Anything blood sugar wise below 70 is a medical emergency. Okay. And always remember, co and clammy gives candy. So if you guys check a blood sugar level of someone who have a 70, below 70 uh, blood glucose level, you guys recheck it one more time to make sure that you guys have the correct blood sugar level. And after the second check and it's still less than 70, we go ahead and do the 15 rules. So the 15 rule is first, we give them a 15 gram of simple carbohydrate. This can be in form of fruit juice, apple juice, regular soft drink. Then we recheck them in 15 minutes. And if the blood sugar level is still not improved more than 70, we repeat it for about two more times. And if it's not improved after two more times or three times of trying, we have to notify the doctor. Next, diabetes type one. So these are the signs symptoms that you guys have to remember. Remember the three Ps. Remember that they can have excessive diet, excessive urine, uh, excessive appetite and uh, excessive thirst. They can be fatigue, weight loss, ketone in the urine, ketoacidosis, and DKA. The only difference between type 1 and type 2 is the ketone. So please remember that. Diabetes type 2, they will have recurrent infection, fatigue. So if in the exam, she mentioned something about recurrent infection, recurrent vaginal candidiasis or vaginal yeast infection, it's going to be diabetes type 2 they won't have recurrent infection in type one, only type two. And then these, of course, patient can have the three Ps and also can have weight loss again, um, also prolonged wound healing, and they can have visual problems. So that is how you distinguish between two types. Diabetic ketoacidosis. So this is DKA. Diabetic D is ketoacidosis only happen in type one diabetes. So please remember this. Um, characteristic is hyperglycemia. Whenever we have high sugar, um, we, in a, we 
our body is very dehydrated because the salute is so high, the level of sugar is so high that the volume of the blood is becomes so low. So we get very dehydrated. And when, again, when the volume of the blood is low, we can have low blood pressure, high heart rate, okay? Because we don't have enough blood volume. So the hypotension, we have low blood pressure and the heart needs to be faster in order to perfuse the body. So that's why we have tachycardia. And then the patient definitely can have uh, keto ketosis and in an acidosis taste state. Uh, ketosis, ketones is produced because the body cannot break down glucose because they don't have insulin. So that's why uh, so that, that is the reason why the body will break down fat instead. And when they break down fat, it show, it uh, produces ketone, which is a byproduct of that process. And when there's so much ketones in the body, the body will be in acidosis state and they will be in metabolic acidosis and that's not good. Uh, the patient can have hypokalemia. They have polyuria, like peeing a lot and they're very be thirsty. The skin will be dehydration. Uh, they'll have poor skin turgor, dry mucus, tachycardia, orthostatic hypertension. Orthostatic hypertension is basically when they stand up or sit up from the, a lying position, they have a dizziness. Next, we have early sign, which is lethargy and weakness. As progress, the skin becomes dry and loose, the eyes soft and sunken, nausea and vomiting, Cosmo respiration with sweet, fruity breath odor, acetone. So remember that Cosmo respiration. What is Cosmo respiration? Cosmo respiration is deep and rapid breathing patterns. Deep and rapid breathing patterns. And also patients with DKA will have a sweet, a fruity breath odor, like acetone smell. Uh, blood sugar will be more than or equal to 250. The blood pH will be lower than 7.30 and the serum bicarbonate is less than 16. Regular level is 22 to 26 for bicarbonate. Blood pH regular level is 7.35 to 7.45. Okay, they will have moderate to high ketones in the urine. Again, Cosmo is deep, rapid breathing the body attempt to expel carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is an acid, acidic agent. And because the body is full of ketones, which is also an acid agent, so it's trying to compensate that by expelling as much carbon dioxide as possible to return the pH level to a homostasis range. The goal is to prevent hypovolemic shock because these patients keep peeing out and they have very dehydrated because of the high sugar content in their blood. So we have to prevent the hypovolemic shock. And what is the classic side of hypovolemic shock? Low blood pressure, high heart rate. Emergency management for DKA. So you guys have to know this. This will be on the exam. So know this slide by heart. Ace the question. There's only two, three questions about DKA. You guys need to get it. So ensure patient have a patent airway and administer oxygen. That's the first thing. Then they, we have to establish IV access. Then we begin normal saline or half normal saline. So if she give you a um, normal saline or 0.5% normal saline, that is the fluid that you guys want to pick because it is isotonic fluid, it prevents dehydration. Then we simultaneously start IV insulin regular, short acting. Insulin regular is the only insulin that can be given IV. When the blood sugar reaches 250 or lower, we then change the fluid from normal saline, 0.9% to dextro 5% or 10% to add it into the normal saline. This is to decrease the risk of cerebral edema, prevent fluid overload, and not to cause too rapid decrease of blood sugar. Okay, after we reach the blood sugar to about 200 or below, we then slow down the fluid and then take off the insulin. 
So during this whole process of managing the DKA, we have to monitor the patient potassium level. This is because when we administer insulin to the body, the insulin will shift the potassium in the blood back into the cells and causes hypokalemia, low potassium. So we have to constantly checking. So what is the sign symptom of hypokalemia? So sign and symptom of hypokalemia will always go, go opposite with the prefix, will always go with the prefix um, and uh, accept uh, heart rate and urine output. So what do I mean by that? So hypo is the prefix. So it always go with the prefix. So everything will go down. The patient will be lethargic. They will be hard to arouse. Um, and then uh, the heart rate will be increased because except heart rate and urine output and the urine output will be increased. So we have to constantly checking for signs symptom of hypokalemia and uh, and then uh, because of that reason. And potassium is predominantly intracellular. Next, we have ABGs, arterial blood gas. So pH level, regular level is 7.35 to 7.45. Carbon dioxide is 35 to 45. Bicarbonate is 22 to 26, okay? So bicarbonate is an alkaline agent. The more bicarbonate, the more alkaline the blood is. Carbon dioxide and acidic agent, the higher the carbon dioxide level, the more acidic the blood is. Bicarbonate is produced from the kidney, so it's metabolic. Carbon dioxide is relating to the lung, so it's respiration and the pH level. Next, we have bronchoscopy and thoracoscopy. So we have to know what these procedures do. So bronchoscopy, thoracoscopy, it used to visualize inside the patient's lungs. Um, and the patient has to be NPO 48 hours prior to the procedure because the, patient, the doctor is going to insert a tube into their mouth and into the trachea to visualize the patient's lungs. So this can be used to obtain biopsy, remove object, assess airway damage, and stage cancer. So we need to know this because there might be a question she will ask you guys. So the patient is going to a bronchoscopy um, um, schedule and uh, what is the purpose of this? So, so lidocaine is sprayed into the back of the throat to numb the gag reflex. So when the patient come back, they are at risk for aspiration. So because the gag reflex is numb because there are lidocaine spray in there. So we do not give them water, do not give them food. The nurse must check for gap and cough reflex before administering anything. Next, we have thoracic synthesis. So this is basically withdraw fluid from the lung for biopsy. To prepare, we put the patient in tripod position, okay? This is the tripod position. Uh, potential complication is pneumothorax because, uh, because when we withdraw in the fluid, we poke a hold and insert the, uh, the, the tube into the patient um, uh, thoracic area, and this can puncture the patient's lung, so it can have a complication of pneumothorax. It can cause lung collapse, diminished lung sound, tachycardia, tracheal deviation if lungs collapse. So always remember the trachea will deviate it to the good sign of the body whenever there's a collapsed lung. And tracheal deviation, meaning that one of the lung is collapsed. Sputum test. So sputum test is usually test for infections and bacteria, uh, and it should be always done in the morning. If you guys have any question regarding sputum uh, on the exam, always remember that we do this in the morning. Next, we have pneumonia. Basically, pneumonia is infection in the lungs. 
So in order to prevent pneumonia, we have to teach the patient to use incentive spirometer breathing exercise. And when do we teach the patient? We teach them during the preoperative stage. Antibiotic is a priority. Inflammation response. Oh, talking about antibiotic, when do we give antibiotic? We give antibiotic after we have the culture. So we do the culture, the sputum, the culture first. Then we give them a broad spectrum antibiotic. After we have the results from the culture, we then can give a specific antibiotic that targeting the specific bacteria strain that found in the culture. Uh, inflammatory response is the, is the process when there's uh, bacteria in the lungs. It causes inflammatory response. It leads to the capillary wall in the lungs became leaky, and the fluid will shift from the capillary to the interstitial space, and it can leak into the alveoli. And again, when the alveoli, which where is the gas exchange area, is filled with fluid, the patient won't be able to breathe very productively. They're basically drowning in their own fluid. So a uh, VQ mismatch is poorly oxygenated blood returns to the heart leads to arterial hypoxia because when the blood flows through the lungs, it does not get enough oxygen from the alveoli because of the fluid barrier. So it returns to the heart with poorly oxygenated, poorly oxygenation, and then um, the heart doesn't have enough oxygen, oxygen to produce, to perfuse for the rest of the body. Uh, basically, it is an infection to the lung caused by bacteria or virus. This is pneumonia. Uh, inflammatory, lead to inflammatory response, uh, lead to alveolar edema, uh, uh, formation of exudate, uh, lead to alveoli and respiratory bronchioles filled with serous exudate, plus cells, bacteria, and fibrin, and constantly consolidation of the lung tissues. Consolidation is basically why patches and uh, when it show on the x-ray. So the sign and symptom include lung sound will be diminished. The patient will have fever. Uh, they'll cough in green. Uh, they'll have yellow mucus. The white blood count will increase. However, this doesn't tell us that they have a lung infection, even the chest ray. A positive culture will confirm that the patient has pneumonia. And always remember the culture is done in the morning for more built up. And we always do the culture before the antibiotic. Tracheostomy, trach. So it, this is remembered, important to remember as well. We need to know when to, re, when to change the dressing. We need to know when we have to suction for the patient. So tracheostomy is, is a tool to facilitate secretion removal. So these patients are unable to cough. We have to remove the secretion in order for their airway to be patent so the air can travel in. We have to assess the need for suctioning hourly, 60 minute, Q60 minute, includes coughing, coarse crackle, wheezes, moist cough, and agitation. Provide pre-oxygenation for at least 30 seconds uh, before we suction the patient and we insert without suction until patient cough. Okay, that's important. Insert without suction. We don't want to suction what, when we're inserting. We have to insert without suction until the patient cough. That's when we know that we are at the good place. We immediately stop suction if the patient become bradycardic, meaning low heart rate. What is low heart rate? significantly drop below the baseline level of that patient or hypotensive low blood pressure or they can have a dysrhythmia uh, or the SpO2 is less than 90%. It's important that we have the SpO2 monitor on the patient finger before we start suctioning. Then we wait at least 30 seconds to suction again and must hyperoxygenate patient for at least 30 seconds in between suction, okay? So we suction, we put the patient on oxygen, then we suction, then we put them on oxygen again. And then before we suction the second time, we put more one more time for oxygen. So we only allow three passes of suction at a time. 
If not all clear out, we let the patient rest and come back at another time. We always keep a replacement tube of equal or smaller size at bedside, like an ambu bag, replacement track, and suction. All right, next we have something called tuberculosis. So TB is also a very important material that you guys need to know. So this is bacteria goes into the lung and tear it up. The patient will show sign of fatigue, malaise, night sweat. So night sweat is a big thing. Um, chronic productive cough and hemoptysis. Hemoptysis is coughing blood. Um, and this is at advanced stage. They'll have pleuritic, which is pain in the chest when breathing and low grade temperature. Um, tuberculosis is caused by a specific strain of bacteria called the acid fast bacilli, and the patient cough blood and have night sweat. The nurse should wear a mask and start isolation. Okay, next we have tuberculosis skin testing. This will be on the exam, let me tell you. It will be. So please learn this. A positive finding is that a TB is put in the arm. There will be a little reaction. Redness and swelling will occur. If it stays swelling and big after 48 to 72 hours, you may have been exposed to TB. So if there's an exam question about TB reaction and it's positive, it does not mean that the patient have TB. It only means that the patient may have been exposed, okay, to TB. This test is only tell that you may have been exposed to TB. It's not a confirmatory that, oh, that person have TB. So the area of induration, the swelling size is measured. So if it's larger than 15 milliliter, is for general public without risk factors. So if it's about Eight, if, so if it's about eight milliliter and they are fall into the public with the risk factor, then they're fine. But if it's 16 milliliter, that means that they have a positive test. So for resident of long-term healthcare facility, IV drug abuser and healthcare worker, including nurses, paramedics, if it's large than 10 milliliter, it means that they may it means that they may have been exposed and it is a positive test. So if it's uh, 12 milliliter, 12 milliliter, if they fall under the general public with that risk factor, they're fine. But if they are a healthcare worker or IV drug abuser and if it's 12 milliliter, that's a problem. Okay, next we have large than five milliliter for HIV positive recent contact with active TB. Okay. So next step after the positive TB test is they will be sent to do an X-ray to see what's going on in the lung. However, this is still not a confirmatory for TB. This building for TB is the confirmatory test. The sputum will be collected and test for acid bas bacilli. If this sputum is positive, if this sputum is positive, meaning that they have acid pa pass, acid fast bacilli in there, we confirm that the patient have tuberculosis. So patient who, are to, who have tuberculosis is often put in isolation, negative pressure room, until we have three acid fast bacilli, bacilli negative tests and still stay on medication for six to 12 months, even after three time negative test result, okay? So they need three negative consecutive tests in order to be out of isolation, but even they out of isolation, they still have to continue taking six to 12 months of medication, okay? Lastly, we have COPD. So COPD is destruction from alveoli collapse. So this is not reversible. This is not like asthma. Asthma, it can be reversible, but COPD is someone who have a constant damage and destroy the alveoli. So it's not reversible anymore. COPD is a combination of emphysema and chronic bronchitis. What is emphysema? Emphysema is the loss of elasticity of the alveoli. So what does that mean? That means that when we breathe in, the alveoli expand. When we breathe out, the alveoli recoins. So expand and recoin, that's because they have a good elastic. So if they lost elastic, when the patient breathes in, 
the alveoli light is not expand anymore. And if it not expand, there will not be not a lot of space or air to come in. So if there's not a lot of air coming in, the patient won't have a good oxygen. They won't have an effective oxygenation. So they will have an effective oxygenation pattern. Okay, an effective um, oxygenation. Chronic bronchitis is rigidity of air way due to chronic inflammation and scarring. This meaning that the, uh, the, bron the bronchioles is, um, is rigid because of all this scarring and all this inflammation. And it's the same concept. If the bronchial is not expand and is too red, rigid, there's not enough air that can come in or come out for the patient. So the pathophysiology behind COPD is increased mucus producing cells, chronic inflammation, bronchial narrow, clock with mucus, structural change in lungs. Please give me one second. I charged my laptop real quick. It's going to die. I don't want to. So again, patho is ingrained mucus producing cells. It leads to chronic inflammation. The bronchioles get narrowed. It clogs with mucus and structural change in the lungs. So what are the signs and symptoms? So if you guys, if she give you a question regarding dyspnea, chronic cough, battle chest, these are a classic sign of COPD. The patient will have a very big front chest and also a very big hump at the back. So that's called barrel chest. And the breast cell will have a bronchi sound. So it's low pitch and associated with fluid in lower airway and it's narrowing. The patient will be always in a tripod position uh, because they're hungry for air. Because remember the, the alveoli, it, it lost elasticity. It's so small that they don't have enough air going in to exchange. Um, they will use a lot of accessory muscle. Like they, you guys can see the struggle when they breathe and the nails will be clubbing like this part, it will be really like up and the nail will be very thin. They have prolonged expiratory, they have diminished breath sound, prolonged expirations and wrong kind wheezes. All right, we did it guys. So we finished 32 slides of review for the message one um, exam review session. So again, please go ahead and um, practice with these uh, questions uh, on this Kahoot. Um, it will give you guys uh, a very good uh, test. Also, some, again, uh, when you guys take the exam, please very calm, read the question very carefully. Please remember the airway, breathing, circulations, um, know the signs, symptoms of diabetes. And um, every 15 minutes, you guys have to stop, close your eyes and tell yourself that you notice, you studied, um, you have prepared. Um, and then for like two minutes and then go back and do the test so that you guys have fresh mind after every 15 questions so that you guys don't burn out and you guys can have a clearest mind when you guys pick the answer choice. Uh, so that's my recommendation. And also um, just trust your gut, uh, go with your first choice, uh, definitely go with your first choice. And when you guys text the, um, text the, uh, the uh, multiple, select all the apply questions, uh, make sure that you guys going to um, treat it as true or false. Read every questions, rationales, answer, and then make sure treat it as true or false, okay? So thank you very much for everyone who attending. I will post the links of the Kahoot uh, for y'all, so don't worry about that. Um, thank you very much for today and good luck tomorrow. Let me know how it goes. Or if you guys have any more questions, don't feel free to text, message, or email me. Thank you.